This is the eighth example video in our series on abstract algebra. And the main lecture video was about homomorphisms and isomorphisms, and really an introduction to those two topics. So for our first example, we'll describe all possible homomorphisms between Z12 and Z20. And the important points from the lecture video for this problem go like this. So if phi from G1 to G2 is a homomorphism, then if this makes sense, so the orders are finite, the order of phi of G must divide the order of G. And then one more thing, if G is a cyclic group generated by little g, then phi is completely determined by its value on that generator. Okay, so like I said, we proved each of these in the video. Now, let's apply that to our setup. So notice that the order of the number one inside of Z12 is equal to 12. Okay, but that tells us that the order of phi of one must divide 12. So that, that only gives us a couple of possibilities for the order of phi of one, given that there are only a couple of possibilities for divisors of 12. So let's notice the possibilities for the order of phi of one. We could have that the order of phi of one is equal to one. So that means that one would be mapped to the identity. We could have that the order is two, three, four, six, or 12. So something like that. And now we're just going to go through each of these one at a time and see what homomorphisms we get out of these. Okay, so let's maybe look at this first example where the order of phi of 1 equals 1. But in that case, we have phi of 1 is just equal to 0. But 1 is the generator of Z12, so that means that phi of n is equal to 0 for all n inside of Z12. So in other words, we have the trivial homomorphism between Z12 and Z20. And in fact, we could have the trivial homomorphism between any group and Z20 where we just take every element of any group to zero. So this is maybe not super interesting, but it is something that we do need to look at. So now let's look into this next case. And this next case would be what happens if the order of phi of one equals two. So that means we need to look for elements of order two inside of Z20. Well, let's maybe recall one more thing before we really dive into that, and that is in Zn, the order of the number m is equal to n over the GCD of m with n. Okay, so that's something that we proved in the video on cyclic groups. So that means that we could find elements of order two in Z20 using this sort of idea. But I think we're only gonna get one in that case and that is the number 10. And that's because 10 is the only element of Z20 whose GCD with 20 is equal to 10 using this formula up here. Okay, so let's see, 10 is in Z20 is the only one, I'll say. Okay, but since we've decided to send one to an element of order two, but 10 is the only element of order two, then that means we have phi of one is equal to 10. But then in general, this would simplify to phi of n is equal to n times 10, or maybe 10n. And this is be, will be for all n inside of Z12. And so that's just applying the fact that we are inside a cyclic group, and n can be written as 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times. Okay, so that would be our second homomorphism. We've got a homomorphism here, which is the trivial homomorphism, everything sent to zero. Homomorphism here, where everything is multiplied by 10. Okay, so now let's look at this next case. So maybe we'll cover the next two cases all at once, but they won't be like consecutive here. 
maybe we'll say what happens if the order of phi of one is equal to three, the order of phi of one is equal to six, or the order of phi of one is equal to 12. And let's notice that that is not possible. And that's because there are no elements of those orders within Z20. So the only possible orders within Z20 will be divisors of 20. These are clearly not divisors of 20. So this is not a possible situation. And that brings us to our last possible case, which is our only last case here. And that will be what happens if the order of phi of one is equal to four. Now we'll wanna look for elements of order four within Z20. So let's write that out, elements of order four in Z20. So what are those? Well, I think it's pretty clear that five is an element of order four by this formula up here. Also just by the fact that five plus five plus five plus five is zero. And then 15 will be the only other one. And that's because that's the only number in Z20 whose GCD with 20 is five, other than five, of course. So that gives us two possibilities. We have phi of one could be equal to five, which would tell us that phi of n would be equal to five n, or we could have phi of one equal to 15, which tells us that phi of n is equal to 15 n. So now on the board, we have all of our possibilities. So let's maybe square them all in this magenta color. That's one possible homomorphism. This is a possible homomorphism. And then these two are our last two homomorphisms. That means we have four total possible homomorphisms. For our next example, we'll show that U8 is isomorphic to U12. So let's recall that that's the multiplicative group mod eight versus the multiplicative group mod 12, where we keep numbers that are relatively prime to each of those. So let's examine U8 first. So that'll contain the numbers one, three, five, and seven. Let's also notice that everything is its own inverse. Three squared is equal to nine, which is equal to one in U8. Five squared is equal to 25, which is equal to one in U8. And seven squared is equal to 49, which is also equal to one inside of U8. Furthermore, we have three times five is equal to 15, which is equal to seven inside of U8. So that gives us some idea of what's going on here. We really have like generators three and five, and then seven can be written in terms of three and five. Now let's look at what's going on with U12. So that's gonna contain the numbers one. We can't have two, three, or four, but we can have five. We can also have seven and 11. We'll also check that five squared is equal to one inside of U12. 7 squared is equal to 49, which is 1 inside of U12. And 11 squared is equal to 121, which is 1 inside of U12. And then furthermore, we have 5 times 7. Well, that's equal to 35, but inside of U12, 35 is the same thing as 11. So this is equal to 11 inside of U12. So I think that gives us a pretty clear idea of what our map should be. So let's define our map phi from U8 into U12 by the following rule. So one will get mapped to one, three will get mapped to five, and then five will get mapped to seven, and then finally seven will get mapped to 11. And then just by checking all of the calculations over here inside of that homomorphism, we'll see that everything works. So for example, we have phi of three squared is the same thing as phi of one, which is equal to one, which is the same thing as five squared, which is the same thing as phi of three times phi of three. 
So there we have our homomorphism rule on the number three, if you will. Furthermore, we have phi of seven is equal to 11, but 11 is equal to five times seven, as our calculation over here showed, but that's equal to phi of three times phi of five by the definition of our function. But then also seven itself is equal to three times five over here. Okay, so that shows that we have a homomorphism in that way. And then also clearly our map is injective and bijective. So in these small cases, all it really boils down to is checking that everything works for all possible multiplications. I'll leave the rest for you. For our next example, we'll show that the additive group of real numbers is not isomorphic to the multiplicative group of non-zero real numbers. In other words, r is not isomorphic to r times. Okay, so we'll do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, so let's suppose we have an isomorphism. So, and I'll rewrite this in a different order here just because that'll be useful for our exact calculation. So we have r times is isomorphic to r, and this is via phi, which goes from r times to r. Okay, but now since this is an isomorphism, it's bijective. So let's take something that I'll call x inside of r times, such that phi of x equals negative one. So it's the pre-image of negative one. And then let's set y equal to phi of x over two, just for like simplicity of the calculation. And now let's notice that the following calculation proves to be a bit problematic. So we'll have y squared equals phi of x over two times phi of x over two, just by the definition of y squared. But now that's gonna to push together to phi of x over two plus x over two. Because outside of phi, we're in the domain, which is a multiplicative group, but inside of phi, we're in the codomain, which is an additive group. But now if we add those two together inside, we get phi of x, which is equal to negative one. So let's notice that we have y is a real number with y squared equals minus one. But that's a clear contradiction because there is no real number that squares to minus one. So what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted our ability to have an isomorphism in the first place, and thus these are non-isomorphic groups. So our next example is a right version of something we saw in the main video, and that is to prove that phi, a map from G to SG, where that is the permutation group on the elements of G thought of as a set, defined by phi of G equals R sub G, where R sub G is a bijection from G to G, defined by R G evaluated at X equals X G inverse, is in fact an injective homomorphism. So previously we know that SG is a group, so we're good to go here. I guess you might need to check that RG is itself a bijection, but that's fairly easy. I'll leave that for you. Okay, so let's check that this is a homomorphism. Oh, and I'd like to, sh to note that this is called the right regular representation of G in S of G. We looked at the left regular representation in the main video. Okay, so let's look at phi of g times h, so that should be r of g h. Okay, and now let's note that r g h x equals x g h all inverse. But now by the shoes and socks theorem, that's gonna be x, h inverse, g inverse. And now we can just work from the inside to the outside. So that's gonna be, let's see, r, h evaluated at x, and then that multiplied by g inverse. But that's gonna be r, g, um, operating on R H of X. So that's gonna be R G composed with R H evaluated at X.
So now let's maybe bring this down. So phi of gh equals rgh, but by this equation right here, we've shown that that is r of g composed with r of h, which is exactly equal to phi of g times phi of h, making this a homomorphism. Now let's quickly show its injective. So let's say phi of g equals phi of h. But that tells us that r of g of x equals r of h of x for all x inside of g. That's because phi of g is r sub g and phi of h is r sub h. But those are functions and for functions to be equal, they must be equal on every element of their domain. Okay, but those functions have formulas. So this is x g inverse um, equals x h inverse. But now we can do some cancellation. We can do left cancellation, giving us g inverse equals h inverse, and then invert both sides, giving us g equals h, which is exactly what we needed for this to be an injective homomorphism. So the next problem deals with composition of homomorphisms. So let's suppose that phi going from g1 to g2 and psi going from g2 to g3 are both group homomorphisms. Then let's show that psi composed with phi going from g1 to g3 is also a homomorphism. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's suppose that x and y are inside of g1 and let's look at psi composed with phi evaluated at x times y. Okay, so using the definition of composition of functions, this gives us psi evaluated at phi of xy. Okay, but then using the fact that phi is a homomorphism, we have this as psi phi of x times phi of y. And then using the fact that psi is a homomorphism, that gives us psi of phi of x times psi of phi of y. But then using the definition of composition will take us to the end. So this is psi composed with phi of x times psi composed with phi of y. But that's exactly all we needed for this to be a homomorphism.